Hi, and welcome to Business Unusual. I am Liz Whitehead, co-host, co-mastermind of Diversity Masterminds, and I'm here with Heather Cox. Hi. And today our guest is Courtney Moore from the Kelly Parker Foundation. Hi, Courtney. Hi, thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you for being here. So we're going to get into what happens when business unusual becomes business as usual. But before we do that, tell us a little bit about the Kelly Parker Foundation and what you're doing there. Absolutely. Love to. Thank you very much. So I started Kelly Parker Foundation in 2017, uh, really focused on the advent of equality of access to information. For me, in my personal point of view, I think access to information is really the greatest form of equity and equality because there's so many opportunities that people miss just because they don't know what they don't know. And so we focus on the advent of the intersection of diversity and inclusion in business. So right now we're focused on a series of webinars uh, that we're partnering along with MGM to focus on uh, how businesses can be more effective in driving uh, equality of opportunity throughout COVID and after COVID. So creating a differential value proposition for your business so you can be more effective in marketing and networking to large companies. And then uh, as you move through the marketing phase, then also focusing on execution, because if you don't have the capacity to deliver, you can very easily ruin a relationship rather than building a relationship. And so uh, we're really focusing on providing the resources and education uh, as so many small businesses are challenged right now. That's so timely right now, but <laughs> I know you're in such the right spot at the right time. But presumably you started this before COVID. Yeah, 2017. So what was the inspiration? Yeah. yeah. yeah so um, in a prior life, I was director of uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion strategy and partnerships uh, for a large gaming company in Las Vegas. And in that role, I really focused on bringing the two partners together. So the corporate partner and the vendor and business, and how can we create uh, a more effective marriage or relationship between those two entities? So making sure businesses were prepared and then we as the corporate partner uh, being effective and sometimes even in some cases mentoring or helping to develop uh, those businesses. So out of that, I really began to think about how could I better serve uh, the community in my own personal journey. And so what I recognized was my personal journey for my family uh, changed when my uh, grandmothers decided to move each of their respective families from the rural South into uh, the Northeast. So my dad's mother was and his family were living in Georgia in, up until the 1950s. And my mother's family was from rural Virginia and they relocated to Connecticut in the 1960s. And it was really through that relocation that uh, each of those families had better economic opportunities, better opportunities for education. And so I named uh, Kelly Parker Foundation after each of my uh, maternal and paternal grandmothers. Oh, wow. That's so cool. And are they still with us? Are your grandmothers still with us? Uh, we are unfortunately uh, one in one. So my dad's mom uh, did pass, but uh, she's, she lived to the ripe age of uh, 92 Wow. Um, so thankfully, you know, she got a lot of, a lot of time here. Yeah. Well, I'm sure that your family is thrilled with the way you're honoring them too. So this drive for diversity, equity, inclusion, this has been your career. This has been your focus the whole way. Uh, it's been a personal focus of mine. I put it into action, uh, beginning in 2016 when I, took on a leadership role at, uh, at the gaming company to lead diversity and inclusion for the organization. Um, prior to that, I actually worked uh, in an analytical capacity. So my background is actually numbers, uh, finance, and more business-centric uh, disciplines. Um, and so the reason I wanted to bring the diversity aspect into it is because what I found was diversity and inclusion work oftentimes didn't get the just uh, due that it was that it earned because it wasn't seen as a true business discipline. And so having a background in analytics and business, I was able to bring a lot more credibility to the focus of the work um, because you can go into the C-suite or speak to senior leaders and talk their language. You can talk ROI, you can talk profitability. And so, you know, 
in the true spirit of diversity and inclusion, really meeting people where they are and understanding that because they may not necessarily understand the full complement of the, the social impact, uh, understanding how diversity and inclusion can better serve a business more comprehensively was really a foundation and an anchor point um, for how we were able to advance diversity and inclusion at my, uh, you know, in the business roles that I've been a part of. I love that you just said that you brought the analytics part because I do think that's so often the part that's left out. And then what happens is that, to your point, the diverse suppliers don't get the elevation that they need because no one's talking that analytical business number part. I mean, like Liz and I talk about the business case for supply diversity all the time, but you, even the way you're going to present it, it's going to be different because Liz has more than, has definitely more than I do, but I don't have that kind of like mathematical analytical. I'm like, it's making the world better people. How do you not get this? <laughs> right. And you're like, let me break it down in numbers, which is so great because that's exactly what that C-suite needs. So we need more of you in all of our lives. Yeah, well, thank you for that. I, I, I would just say it's a yes and, right? So we don't wanna lose sight of sort of the human component of what we're talking about because oftentimes when you're talking about diversity and inclusion, you're just talking about people and how things impact them at the most uh, personal aspects or points of identity for who they, who they are or how they see the world. But at the same time, if you're not able to translate that into a business focus, then, you know, oftentimes it sort of goes by the wayside and kind of just blows through the wind. It's like, yeah, that's great. We made people feel good for a little bit, but there's no sticking, right? So you need to have right. an anchor. Right. I love that. The yes and. In our last, another interview we had, we talked about the meritocracy plus. That yes, it's a meritocracy plus there are these other community and business impact benefits. So Absolutely. Yeah. So um, let's get into COVID-19 and you as, so you have a foundation relatively new since 2017. How has COVID-19 affected you and the people that you're serving? Uh, COVID-19 has been nothing short of a big mountain to climb. Um, so the, the, the pants, <laughs> oh, PG, right. the push. So just very, <laughs> Very simply, I had a friend who was in the process of doing a rebuild and a build out for a restaurant here in Las Vegas. He invested $250,000 into the restaurant only to a week later be told that he had to mm. close doors, right? Because, mm. because of COVID and he couldn't serve any customers. And so, you know, for a new restaurant, I mean, that's almost, you know, you're talking about going into bankruptcy and you're not because you don't have your client base, you don't have, you know, your core, your core customers, et cetera, your marketing, you've invested so much money. So knowing that people personally that were, you know, essentially in these types of situations, I just thought, what are some things that I could do personally uh, to really help the community in terms of uplifting everyone and really driving uh, the message about resources and opportunities for businesses that have been affected in this particular way. And so what I set out to do was uh, partner with like-minded individuals and subject matter experts. So to Heather's point earlier, I'm not an expert in all things. Uh, so I have friends that have worked for various uh, support organizations like the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, NMSDC, and others. So I just reached out to them and asked for their help in putting together a web series that was focused on uh, the education piece. And so that's really what I've been doing is to, you know, educate people about the tremendous effect that COVID-19 has had on small businesses, because we see the targets and the Walmarts open and people are still going there to get, you know, hundred dollar rolls of toilet paper, you know, when this whole thing first started, but uh, you know, communities are really built primarily on the backs of small businesses. And so if we want to have successful communities, we need to have successful small businesses. Correct. I think people are seeing that now. And I think, you know, we've asked a lot of the, our guests, what's the one thing you hope you help, you know, hope sticks after this whole thing. And a lot of them have come back with that people still appreciate small businesses, because I think now people are really realizing how important it is to support your local small and diverse businesses more than they've ever realized it. So like, Yes, targets are important and the Walmarts are important. They're going to be around regardless, right? I think I've single-handedly kept Target open by, you know, clothing and diapering my five babies. 
But right. now when I'm going out to find them things, right, I'm looking for these women in minority and local small businesses because they just, they appreciate you and they really, they're hiring local. They're, you know, they're doing all these things. So you're a hundred percent. We agree with you a hundred percent. Yeah. And then along with that focus on buying local, we've also seen um, a, an awakening of buying from black owned businesses as well because of the Black Lives Matter movement and how that's working. So how, how does the Kelly Parker Foundation, or you personally, how are you participating in that for black owned businesses? So uh, surprise, I'm black, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's new. <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and so for me, it really starts at home, right? So when, I, when we go, when my family uh, begin, you know, purchasing, the various things that make a home, a home go, or when we go and select various restaurants, et cetera, we oftentimes are looking for how can we support diverse owned businesses? And that really runs the full gamut or, or spectrum from something as obvious as like we're talking about black owned businesses or LGBTQ, women owned, et cetera, and really supporting and anchoring those businesses. But for me, that's just an aspect of being a person in and of itself. Because as you're supporting locally and small owned businesses, you're supporting all of those individual demographics and identities as well. So for us, one thing that we do is we have a, a book in our home um, that features uh, black owned businesses. And so if there's an opportunity where we can source from one of those particular businesses, we'll look in that book and say, okay, great. Here's somebody that we can go support when we go out to dinner, for example, we look for those different businesses within our community. Um, and then a great way is really just word of mouth. I found that to be the most effective means of uh, sort of sharing the wealth is just reaching out to my network and saying, hey, I'm looking for X type of provider, right? Doctor is another great one that we talk about um, in some of the more professional pursuits, lawyer, et cetera. And so, you know, for every aspect that touches your life, there's a diverse owned business that can perhaps uh, meet that need. So just really asking friends too was a great way to do that. Yeah, that's and great. I also point out that Courtney has been a, a huge advocate for the disability owned businesses, which is also a category that kind of oftentimes gets left aside. But he, like when we first talked about the disability and locally, he had grabbed the bulls by the horn and he was like, yes, I definitely want to be part of it. And even now, as we were talking about Kelly Parker, is it, it is a huge, it's a, a huge um, position that you want to support, right? The disability-owned businesses as well, because they're a little, especially the ones with invisible disabilities, are harder to see, are harder to spot. Absolutely, absolutely. And you make a great point, Heather, about the dis disability-owned, excuse me, the disabled-owned businesses, uh, because again, a disability is something that may or may not have the ability to be seen. And so being more intentional about how you engage with these individual businesses uh, I think is the most effective means or way to do it. Um, you know, one thing that I really enjoyed seeing as a byproduct of uh, the aftermath of the, the George Floyd incident was that people began to be really intentional about how they uh, supported diverse owned businesses, whether they be disabled, black owned, women owned, et cetera. And I think the most effective way to do that is really just begin asking the question. So what I've seen taking place more now than ever before is just the desire to be more aware and more conscious of decisions that people are making. And I think uh, that's a tremendous step forward because before people weren't even concerned with where their various items were coming from or where they were eating or the businesses that they were supporting. And we were talking earlier about social media, uh, in particular the fashion industry. And what I've seen a lot of people do more, uh, more lately is speaking specifically about, hey, here are certain diverse owned businesses that I partner with as a blogger or people using their platform or their power uh, to advance um, causes like diversity and inclusion, supplier diversity, et cetera. And I think those are key components to advancing the work that we're all doing and making it more effective is the people who already have a voice providing a platform in this space for people who are great at what they do, but they don't have the same voice or platform to, you know, get the, the recognition. So do you feel by that by, and I'm totally taking this off on that tangent, but that's my specialty. Do you feel like this is like exactly what you said, like bringing different voices together that may not have an individual platform, but together 
have a lot, you know, have some very um, influential and powerful messaging to share. Do you think that is what made, has made your, the Kelly Parker Foundation so well received is that you've brought in some like really powerful people who may by themselves don't get enough attention, but when you bring four of them together, then they, the mass that follows them becomes a much bigger crowd. I, I would agree with that. So there's certainly strength in numbers. Uh, you will find that individuals have their own following and, and certain people, maybe they're good at, in terms of being a subject matter expert or they have excellent content, but they're not strong in terms of getting out their own individual message. So the people that know them or the people that are familiar with them uh, can say, you know, person X is excellent. Their content is top notch, but it's hidden under a rock somewhere around a corner and you'll never see it unless you're in the know. And so being more effective at spreading that word through collective partnerships, right? When you talk about supplier diversity, joint ventures are one way to really advance and move the work forward. So essentially you're doing like a, a marketing JV or a social JV when you start talking about these collective partnerships. So it's really a, been beneficial for us, um, especially being a, a newer uh, organization. For example, partnering with MGM has given us a tremendous platform in a much more extended reach as opposed to solely just uh, pushing the message on our own. So it's been really, uh, really advantageous to have partners like that. That's awesome. I like what you said, like a marketing JV, because we always talk that Heather and I, we have our own businesses and then we got business married. Um, <laughs> we have our own, we have a joint venture together. Um, but before you do that, it's good to sort of take a step. It's good to date a little bit. And like, let's market something. Let's see how you do when we do this webinar together. Sure. Um, right. right. So a marketing JV, that's really, that's a good idea. It's a good tip. Like um, great. So now we foreshadowed this question, but um, we want to ask you when coronavirus goes away, what's one thing that you want to actually stay from this time? Mm, that's a great question. What is one thing I would like to stay uh, after coronavirus? Um, the one thing I would like to that I would like to see stay after coronavirus, I would say, is uh, intentionality. So, what I see happening more now than ever before, and this can move even beyond the the bounds of you know the supplier diversity and supply chain space, is being intentional with the things that you do. So, at the advent of uh, the shutdown, I saw people being very intentional with how they were spending their time. You know, I was talking to a gentleman in the line I was in and he was saying, you know, I usually work 18 hours a day. I work six days a week. He had a young daughter and he's like, for the first time in like two years, I just get to be home with my daughter and just spend time with her. And he was being very intentional with how he spent his time because it was such a, it was in such value and high priority that he didn't have the opportunity to do that before. And so I think, to my point earlier about uh, the G George Floyd, is that same type of intentionality uh, became present with how individuals spend their money. And so, you know, voting with your dollar is something that I speak about ad nauseum and really push time and time again, um, because as the people speak and the direction the money flows will let people know what we uh, are advocating and what we no longer wish to support. And so I think being intentional about the businesses that you support, how you spend your time, um, who you partner with, right? We're talking about uh, the joint ventures and how we uh, aggregate our, our partnerships. I think it being very intentional and measured with how we do that is something that I would like to see continue on and moving away from just who's the biggest fish in the pond, so to speak, and just wanting to partner with them is more who can be the most impactful and the most genuine in their interactions. Um, behind that intentionality is something I'd like to see continue. Yeah, we love the voting with your wallet, voting with your dollars. That's like, you really can't make a more powerful statement than who you spend right. your money with, right? Right. And, and you know, there's, there's give and take. So like we talk about this a lot that for me, like, things have to be convenient, but if it's a slight, slight inconvenience and it's a local diverse small business, it's hundred percent worth it to me, right? The monstrosity of inconvenience, I think it depends what it is. But yeah, the voting with your dollars is definitely one of the, the most powerful ways you can say, this is what, what values are important to me. And if you don't support this, like I'm not, you know, if you don't support black owned businesses, okay, fine. I'm not going to hate you for it, but you're not getting my money either. 
Right. right. And I, I think there's, I think there's, you know, I think initially people were a little skeptical or a little reluctant to, to move in that direction. And I hear people talk oftentimes about convenience, but I would say what's more inconvenient than someone not supporting what's important to you. Right. Yeah. Because ultimately, ultimately all we're really talking about is relationships at the end of the day. Like I think sometimes people get caught up in like the transactional nature of going to a store and giving money for a good or service. But ultimately, it all comes back to a relationship. So just like you would have in a dating relationship or a marital relationship, et cetera, if the person didn't really align with your values or morals or things that you thought important, you wouldn't continue that relationship just because it was convenient. Well, this person lives, you know, a mile away from me. And, you know, we argue every time we see each other. And, you know, we don't really get along. (laughs) Right. But it's convenient. But they live a mile away. But we have a terrible time every time, you know, whenever we're together. You wouldn't continue that relationship. You would find something that was more aligned with, you know, the type of relationship that you would want to have. Or in some cases, right, we've even seen people just not be in a relationship at all. That's totally okay. So I don't think you have to do something that's, you know, sort of self-deprecating or, you know, against your own self-interest just to, you know, I don't know, again, buy a good or service, right? I think you can, I think there are so many opportunities. If you're just willing to do a little bit of due diligence, you can find something that's in line with what you believe in or things that you support and not experience that inconvenience. Right. Well put. Well put. And I like how you, like, I feel like we come at this from the supplier diversity perspective, but now that you are in your foundation world, it's even broader than that. Like you can be intentional with your dollars and with your time and yeah. where you live. You People are thinking like, why am I living in this place when I can work anywhere? People are really right. being intentional yeah. about a lot of choices. And I think that that's that's super important. I know that I have been and would love to see that stick. Well, Courtney, right. thank you so much for joining us today. Um, oh, thank tell you. Us, yeah. Well, before we leave, I want Courtney to tell us about the webinar that's yeah. coming up because really important webinar that's coming up that I think a lot of people could benefit from. So I'd love to just hear in his word what is going to be covered, who would, you know, who should attend. Great. So Tuesday, September 15th, um, at uh, 12 p.m. Pacific time, we will have, <clears throat> excuse me, we'll have our second of four webinars. This webinar will feature uh, Farad Ali, CEO of, uh, of an IT infrastructure company. Um, he's also former vice president of National Minority Supplier Development Council. So he's certainly worked uh, his chops in the supplier diversity space. Um, the focus of the webinar is going to be around developing your differential value proposition. So for whatever your business is, it's really essentially, how can you more effectively share your message with large businesses? So one area that you see challenged most often is companies aren't very good at telling uh, a potential client or customer how their business is different from the competitor. Um, They can tell you what they do, but then it's just like, well, doesn't so-and-so already do this? And how is it really different? So this is all about how to create that foundational platform to create that differential proposition between your business and your competitors, particularly if you're a small business, I think this is valuable to you because you can pay someone a lot of money uh, to do this. So you're going to get all this information for free. Um, There'll be two other webinars that are coming in our, uh, in our series three and four. Um, And so we look forward to uh, having you there. Uh, We had 145 uh, companies that we assisted in our first webinar. So we're off to a great start and we're trending in the same direction. Um, for the second one. So really excited about it. Well, that is actually one of those not my favorite topics the differentiation. And it is one of the modules we cover in, in diversity masterminds, because we think it is so crucial because some, you know, there are people who are willing to spend $5 more, right? If you're worth it, and you are the only one that can tell me why you're worth it, right? So right. I think it, that's such a great topic. And I don't think any of us can hear it enough and really work on that differentiator. Great. Awesome. And they find that webinar. How do I get there? How do I register for it? So you can check us. You can go to Kelly Parker Foundation. You can find us on Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, and uh, Facebook. Just look up Kelly Parker Foundation. You'll find all the information about 
uh, the webinars. Awesome. Well, Thanks, thank you Courtney. so much. This is great. This is great. Yeah, I love it. The webinars go awesome. We'll put all that information in the show notes. And we will see you next time on Business Unusual. Thank you.